from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Colleen Chogan, and I'm the Deputy Director for National and International Outreach here at the Library. We're the division responsible for public programming, and the Kluge Center plays an important role in that respect. We'll soon hear introductions of our esteemed panel, but I'd like to take a moment to briefly talk to you about the John W. Kluge Center, directed by Dr. John Haskell, who is on stage. It is our scholarly center at the Library of Congress, but it has a unique mission, namely bringing top minds to Capitol Hill with the goal of informing Congress and the larger Washington, D.C. community. In short, the Kluge Center aims to bridge the division between knowledge and power. The Kluge Center supports visiting scholars each year, both at the junior and the senior levels. We want our residential scholars to utilize the library's vast collections and spend time with our knowledgeable experts and curators. We also want our scholars to share their discoveries and insights. The Kluge Center does that through a variety of programming for the general public, for members of Congress, and for congressional staff. In that regard, I would be remiss if I did not make you aware of some terrific Kluge programming in the near future. Tomorrow, Dr. Bruce Gentleson, a former Kluge Kissinger chair, will discuss his new book, The Peacemakers. That event will take place in room 119 of the Jefferson Building just across the street. Additionally, there's a wide variety of programs scheduled for the coming weeks, ranging from Italian opera to the Bible's role in American history. Please check the Kluge Center website for more information. Finally, we are proud to co-sponsor this event today with the University of Denver. I'd now like to welcome Dean Daniel McIntosh to the stage, who will provide introductory remarks for our panel. Hi, I'm Danny McIntosh. I'm the Dean of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at the University of Denver. And it is a real pleasure to be co-hosting this with the Kluge Center and the Library of Congress. The University of Denver is a private university dedicated to the public good. As, that, as, as such a university, we hope to engage scholars and the community across the nation and across the world. We believe there should be no barriers between scholarship and practice no barriers between campus and the community. Therefore, we encourage and we support our students, faculty, and staff to engage with the wider communities to share their scholarship and to be in conversation with scholars, staff people, and the community across the country. We want to model this integration not only in our work, but also in our students' experiences. From psychology students, who prepare research reports and plans for nonprofits in the city of Denver, to religious studies students who work as interns in faith-based organizations across the country, and from anthropology students who work with rural Coloradans and Japanese Americans interpreting the events and the, the remnants of the Amache internment camp, our students go from the classroom to the field to the lab, understanding how to integrate and tie together scholarship and application. One example of this effort at the University of Denver is the Center on American Politics. The Center on American Politics is a new organization that is interdisciplinary, that ties together scholars from the law school, from arts, humanities, and social sciences, political science, sociology, and international studies, all working to understand the very basis of politics in America. Politics are the way that people's voices are heard it's important for us to understand how this works. One of the speakers today is Professor Seth Maskett, professor in the political science department and director of our new Center on American Politics. Part of the, we want to be part of the conversation. We want to part, be a part of applying our scholarship to issues that are important to critical issues of the time. And as such, we are pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the Kluge Center and the Library of Congress. With that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, John Haskell, who's the director of the Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress. Thank you. Dean McIntosh. <laughs> and uh, as Colleen pointed out a minute ago, uh, we're really happy to, to work with uh, the University of Denver because uh, we're, we're doing what we both want to do, which was to bring our scholars, to bring scholarship to the wider community. And uh, in this particular case, we have Seth and also two other scholars. And, uh, 
Uh, I'll, I'll uh, say a couple of other things about Seth that weren't mentioned. Uh, he's uh, already, he is uh, uh, the, the uh, chair in American Law and Governance here at the Kluge Center. He just started uh, in May, and he'll be here through the summer. And we have uh, other programming in, in mind for him. Um, he is, uh, as pointed out, the, you know, the head of the center at the, at the university and is very well regarded. He's, he's a classic of the kind of scholar we try to bring to the Kluge Center because not only is he well respected within the field, one of the leaders actually within the field and speaking to other academics, he's out there on 538 and a lot of other sites and writes for a much larger audience. Uh, Jennifer Victor uh, is in that same category. Her PhD is from Washington University. She's been at George Mason University as a professor, professor of American politics and legislative politics with a specialty area of uh, political parties, and we're glad to have her for the first time at a Kluge Center event. Uh, Yuval Levin, right here to my right, is uh, a political scientist, also a political philosopher at the University of Chicago. He's at the Ethics and Public Policy Center as a fellow. He's also the editor of National Affairs. He's working on a book right now that uh, is on American institutions, and, and uh, he's, he's thinking about issues about the future of institutions, including the political parties. So we're going to launch right into questions, and, and, and I'm going to uh, ask uh, Jennifer to set the stage. In simple terms, Jennifer, <laughs> what role do political parties play in the US? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Didn't know I was going to be on the hot seat first. <laughs> so um, at a really basic level, the scholarship uh, in political science has thought of parties uh, in different concepts over history. Um, the classic way that I often describe it to students is as a tripartite organization. Uh, that's really sort of three separate organizations. We think of parties in the electorate as the, the partisanship, the party ID that voters hold. Then we think of parties in Congress as the organized bodies within the legislature that help to pass legislation and co control agendas and build coalitions to achieve policy and so forth. And the third part is we think of parties as organizations. This is the DNC and the RNC and all of their component subsidiary organizations at the national and then the state levels. Um, and uh, for a long time, scholars have thought of this tripartite or setup of political parties that in some ways is quite useful, uh, but is also can be kind of confusing because there's a lot of crossover and overlap and interplay between these component parts. Um, and a number of years ago, uh, sort of a, a school, a, a sort of new school of thought emerged around political parties um, that conceptualized them as more of a network of actors, um, some that are policy oriented, some that are more ideologically oriented, where the, poli the parties themselves are made up of activists and writers and thinkers and voters and donors and so forth uh, that make up these dense coalitions of, uh, of participants. Um, so at the end of the day, whichever conceptualization we think is most useful given the current politics, um, I think it's important to think of parties ultimately as organizations that try to win elections. Um, the, a party's job is to win seats in a legislature, uh, whether you're talking about the Congress or in the, in the state governments at the state level. Um, and the various ways that parties do that get, get kind of complicated. One of the areas of, of research that I'd spend a lot of time looking at is campaign finance and the way that donor activity and campaign uh, finance activity plays into all of those various party networks, uh, which I think is a, a big part of the, the question as well. I, I know, Seth, and, and having read some of the things you've written, that, that <coughs> you speak similar to what Jennifer said, that parties, uh, a key role is screening candidates and clearly you want to get the candidate you want to achieve certain policy ends, but then, of course, they got to get elected. Um, are parties today stronger or weaker than they were in, in, in that function, say, 20 years ago or 50 years ago? Yeah, um, I'm going to do the good academic thing and dodge the question. I, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 I don't know that they're stronger or weaker, but they're very different uh, than they were 20 or 50 years ago in the sense that um, the things a party used to do, uh, whether that's um, raise money and spend it on advertising or, or recruit candidates and train them to run for office or uh, you know, help to organize elections, uh, help with voter turnout, um, the formal parties don't do as much of that as they used to. In some ways, they're kind of hampered from the ability to do that um, due to a number of laws that we've put in their way. Um, but there are other groups that can do those things. Um, so, for example, you know, the, the Democratic Party works with 
um, some Democratic clubs and some labor unions and activist groups and organizations like Emily's List or uh, the Human Rights Campaign and other groups that do things like train can candidates and uh, help them get out and, and organize a constituency. And they're all more or less on the same page with each other, but it's very much in the, in the sort of network model that, that Jen was talking about there, that they, that they coordinate these activities across uh, dozens of different organizations. Now, does that mean that they're weaker or stronger than they used to be? I mean, in, in some ways, there are probably some costs to being spread apart, all, uh, spread across all these different organizations. They're still very polarized. They still have a set of beliefs they believe in, but actually figuring out uh, you know, what's your favorite candidate across all these different groups can be tricky. And there's some evidence that um, this fragmentation may have actually contributed to polarization in some ways, because when you have money and all these other things going through these very passionate activist groups, um, they, you, you tend to have a, a much more passionate and, and ideological set of actors involved, whereas the formal parties themselves tend to be pretty pragmatic. Evil, do you have a view on this? I'm saving the really, really hard questions. <laughs> oh, good. I just want to see if, uh, if you have a view on what, what Seth Well, I, first of all, thank you for, for doing this and for, and for involving me in it. I've learned an enormous amount from Jennifer's work on Congress over the years and from Seth on parties. His last book, I think it's your last book, The Inevitable Party, is really a uh, fantastic uh, set of insights on these very questions. I, I think the parties are certainly weaker than they were if we think of them as actually possessed of some purpose. Um, a, a, a party is, the, the, the goal of a party is to allow a, a coalition to cohere and to then help that coalition win elections and govern. And I think that it, it would be easy to show that our coalitions have more trouble cohering than they used to and more trouble governing. And I do think that the weakening of the parties has a lot to do with all of that. Um, the, the, the fact that some of the functions of the parties because of campaign finance laws and other things have been moved to other groups means that they're now in the hands of groups whose function is not to enable a coalition to cohere and then to get elected and to govern, but rather groups that have narrower purposes than that and purposes that very often are at odds with the goal of allowing coalition to cohere. And I certainly think that has a lot to do with why we have become more polarized we have this odd situation, a number of political scientists have pointed this out, of, of intense partisanship amid weak parties. And those things are connected to each other. Um, we have turned over the functions of parties to groups who have much more of an interest in polarization and much less of an interest in broad, nationally electable coalitions. And so I think the parties as institutions uh, are much weaker than they used to be. And I think we pay a price for that. We should want them to be stronger Though, if you want to find an unpopular cause in American politics, <laughs> the parties are it. <laughs> so, is the uh, is the weakness of the party uh, due to the fact that, that that voters and particularly young voters don't really associate with them or identify with them, or is that that's a dependent variable? Well, I think it's related, but you know, b voters are polarized. Voters are uh, m m even people who call themselves independents. As a general matter, voters now identify themselves on the left and right in a more coherent way, not a less coherent way than you would have found a generation ago. And yet, the parties are not stronger. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that we have treated the parties as institutions as part of the problem here, rather than seeing them as potentially part of a solution to the problem of polarization. And the parties have just become, they've come to have less of an organizational institutional existence. They're just platforms for individuals and uh, you really see that. I mean, look, half of the people who ran for president as Republicans in 2016 ran in order to elevate their media profile. They were just running to get better contracts in TV and radio. And the party couldn't stop that. There was nothing they could do about it. In fact, I think the person who ended up winning and winning the presidency probably started out running that way. And the, the party turned out to be pretty helpless against that because it, it, it's lost a sense of itself as an organization with members not just a kind of open field to populate the rest of our democracy. And so the loss of that self-identity as an institution, I think, is certainly a sign of weakness. Jennifer, where are you on the question of the overall health of the parties? I think Yuval made clear his position on that. <laughs> 
No, I, I definitely agree that parties have been demonized in American politics. Americans like to point to partisanship, and, and part, of the, part of the reason I think that happens is because Americans tend to not differentiate partisanship from parties. They think that's the same word and means the same thing. And so if Republicans and Democrats and them fighting is what's wrong with us, that must mean that parties is what's wrong with us. Uh, but in fact, these are separate things. Partisanship is polarized, but parties themselves, um, I'm not sure, uh, I'm less comfortable with describing them as weak and uh, more comfortable describing them as more highly decentralized. Uh, I think the networks in which they operate are much broader and include more players than perhaps they did 50, 60 years ago, uh, but they have less central power within each of their parties. And I think that largely comes from two things. One is internal changes within the parties themselves about how they manage their nomination processes and uh, how they funnel their resources and make their decisions about who to support and so forth. Um, and also uh, laws that govern parties, uh, and per particularly here laws that govern campaign finance. Um, so the main role that parties have is to recruit candidates and fund them and try to win elections. Um, and when campaign finance laws change in such a way as to diminish the power of parties to do those things, um, so the laws that we have on the books now uh, give outside groups and um, any wealthy donor that wants to use their free speech right to go and promote a candidate, um, to play that role, it weakens the power of the party to, to control that process, which is how we wound up with the Republican kerfuffle. So, so there, you know, no, no single component of the, of the political system exists in a vacuum, of course. So are the, are the, is this weakness of the parties or the decentralization, I guess is the word you prefer, um, more sy symptomatic of a larger systemic issue? Or, I mean, the, the model probably feeds into itself, but is it, or are they, is, are parties a, a significant cause of it? Are parties a cause of, of, of polarization? Of, of, of a larger problem in the political system, or are they just symptomatic of that? So to me, a party is an institution that, who's, that performs the, the very convenient feature of solving collective action problems that voters or candidates or legislators need to solve in order to run democracy. So, if parties didn't exist, we would create them because we would need something to do that for us. Um, so to me, parties are in fact, you know, we shouldn't be demonizing. Our parties are the solution to, to most of our problems. They are the mechanisms by which we can take disparate ideas and use them to coalesce around something, uh, to build on the word that, that you've all had used earlier. Um, so uh, the, where it contributes to, to problems is in the, in, the idea that we seem to think parties are a part of the disease and we've weakened the structures uh, on, on which they operate, uh, both internally and externally. It's been sort of an endogenous and exogenous force on them uh, that I think contributes in a, and now it's sort of a self-perpetuating problem. Where are you on this question, Seth, before I hit you with another <laughs> impossible question? I mean, I, I tend to agree with, with what Jen said here, that I, you know, I, I see parties as, Essentially, they do the, they're supposed to be doing the parts of democracy that uh, voters themselves aren't very good at by themselves. They're supposed to you know, take really complex topics and, lot, and groups of lots of candidates and boil them down into fairly simple questions of, should we do this or, do, or that? Um, should we raise taxes or lower them? Should we make this easier to obtain or harder? Um, or this candidate or that candidate? And yeah, when we, you know, when we essentially move too far in the other direction, it, it makes democracy harder, it makes it uh, more confusing for people, it makes voters want to tune out. So, it's, so uh, given everything that all three of you have said, uh, is one party or the other doing better? Mm. Seth? I think one party's doing worse. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think it, it's possible to, to learn too much from 2016. Um, there were many ways in which it was it, possibly just kind of a flukish year, but um, the things we saw going on in the, uh, in, in the Republican presidential nomination cycle in 2016, um, uh, we're, I mean, we're, it was really a pretty fascinating moment. Generally what happens in presidential nominating cycles is that you know, party insiders, you know, people, activists, major donors, uh, people who have just been longstanding, influential within the parties, kind of pick a favorite. Uh, they kind of, you know, long before anyone starts voting in Iowa or New Hampshire, they kind of lean toward one candidate or lean away from some other group of candidates who they think would be bad for the country or bad for the party. Um, and the Republican Party just didn't really make a choice in 2016. Um, a few people came out and endorsed 
Marco Rubio, some worked with Ted Cruz, some were with John Kasich, but they were kind of split and most party leaders just kind of stayed quiet. Um, most members of Congress on the Republican side, governors, just didn't endorse anyone. And that's an environment, when, and when you have 17 candidates, that's an environment in which a very famous wealthy person can just rise to the top, um, with just in the absence of a party signal. And that's, that's really what ended up happening in, in 2016. That didn't happen on the Democratic side. Um, the Democratic Party more or less got uh, uh, you know, the candidate it wanted. The, the insiders were more or less happy with Hillary Clinton. She had a long history of, of policy stances that were very consistent with where the party had been for some time. So they basically got a conventional candidate. Does that mean they're healthier? I don't know. Um, are they, they might face the same problem in 2020 that the Republicans had in 2016. You already have some two dozen Democrats or more who've said that they're interested in running for office. Um, and you know, in the absence of a, of a clear kind of preferred candidate, it, it could be just as fragmented as the Republican one. We will we'll be finding that out within the next year, year and a half. Um, I, I had made a point of saying last year and during 2016 that um, the presidency is not the only thing, that parties uh, work with lots of different offices and just because something, there's some cracking up going on at the presidential level doesn't mean uh, that's going on at the, at, at the state or local level. And in fact, if you looked at Republican congressional uh, nominations in 2016, they were nominating pretty conventional candidates. Um, then comes Roy Moore in Alabama, um, and then and there's some evidence uh, in this cycle that the Republican Party is nominating a lot of people just without any history in, in politics. And maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but it suggests there, there is an unusual dynamic going on within that party. So, so you will, do the Republicans have greater tensions and ideolo ideological diversity? I mean, are they, are, they, you know, are they confronting more challenges in that realm or other realms? Well, I would say, and this relates to the previous question you asked too, I, I do think the parties are subject to some of the same pressures as everything else in our society. Right. And that this idea of institutions getting turned inside out and being turned into platforms for individuals is actually also a way to understand what's going on in Congress where a lot of members come to Congress to get more media exposure and don't think fundamentally about their role as legislators. It's certainly how the president is behaving in the presidency as a kind of performance artist. I think you see it in the, you, you see it in the professions. It's a way to understand what's happening in the universities. So it shouldn't surprise us that this is happening to the parties. If you had asked me before the 2016 election, I would have thought that the Republican Party as a party was in better shape than the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, I think Reince Priebus as chairman of the RNC devoted a lot of attention and energy to strengthening the party as a multi-state national party. He focused on the state parties. He had been a state party chairman himself. And the work they did had real effect. The party as an institution looked much stronger uh, for it. What he didn't do was think at all about the party's role in the presidential race. I think his expectation was that it would just happen as it had. And when the race turned out to be very unusual, Reince had no plan whatsoever. And he, as a result, did nothing whatsoever. Uh, the assumption was these strange candidates would rise and then they'd fall. That, that happened in 2012, it happened in 2008. You know, you'd have a period where this populist businessman would kind of seem like he was leading and then he would disappear and you would have a bunch of senators and governors fighting it out. And I think that the party apparatus itself expected that to happen until very late in the process. And very few, there, you know, there was kind of Mike Lee screaming, standing at the window, banging on it, screaming, saying, stop this. But Almost nobody else was trying to get the party to really act to resolve what was basically a collective action problem. Um, you know, th there, there were too many candidates until very late, and I think it was the case that any two of them combining their efforts might have stopped Trump even pretty late. Um, and they wanted to, and they didn't do it because there was no way to address the collective action problem, which is exactly what the party is for. So. In the wake of 2016, I think you have to say that the Republican Party looks weaker than the Democratic Party. I think it's also the case that they now have the problem that the Democrats had during the Obama years, which is a president with a kind of cult of personality around him in the party that drives attention and energy away from the party. And Obama did enormous damage to the Democratic Party as an institution uh, because he himself was very popular and he didn't try to use that popularity to strengthen the party really in any way. Uh, so that the Democrats came out of the Obama years much weaker as a national party. They had much less strength in the states. They'd lost a lot of seats in state legislatures and in local races and state races. 
And a fair amount of it had to do with Obama drawing all the attention and all the money. That's exactly what is happening now with Trump. The party is having a lot of trouble presenting a face to the country that's not about Trump. And it's also suffering with a very, with a, a, a very unusual generational divide within the party that I think is not getting enough attention, but is a huge problem for the party itself, where older Republicans love Trump. You don't find Republicans over 60 who don't like him. You don't find Republicans under 30 who do like him. And the difference is very, very intense, and it's felt within every institution on the right, so that uh, you know that too is a kind of problem that you would hope a party could help deal with, but I don't think it's in very good shape to do it. So, Seth, you know, you're studying here at the library the, how the Democrats are responding to losing the 2016 elections, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned a minute ago that they've got a couple dozen people of, of some level of seriousness at least. Uh, where are they? I did, they did, in terms of the of the of the mistake, if, if Yuval's right, that, that Priebus made in, in not really having a plan. I mean, are they in a position to have a plan, or is the Democratic Party headed to something that might resemble what happened with Republicans in '16? I mean, part of what I've been doing in in, in my in my current research is just is interviewing Democratic activists in uh, uh, various early primary and caucus states and. Uh, quite a few of them are treated 2016 as kind of a wake-up call. You know, they they are fully cognizant of the kind of underinvestment at the state level, and you know they didn't expect to lose at the presidential level. But then once they lost there, they looked around and said, "Oh my God, we've we've lost all these state legislatures." And so they're they're sorting, you know, seeing this as a as, as an important building time for that, and kind of reinvesting a lot into into state and local candidates. Um, I think some of them are you know feeling encouraged by some of the special elections that have been going on over the last year um, and the ability of the party to essentially pick candidates who are appropriate for their various districts, um, conservative candidates or at least moderate candidates in the more conservative districts and pretty liberal candidates in the more liberal districts. Um, but they were also you know, caught off guard in so many ways and they're, they're still trying to navigate uh, the current system. And, they definitely haven't come up with a plan for, for 2020. Um, most, most of them are not quite, not quite thinking at that level just yet. Jennifer, what's your view on that? So theoretically, I think parties would be better off if they separated presidential elections from state and local and congressional elections mm -hmm. um, because they're, they're two separate processes and, and this collective action process of coalescing around a national candidate during a presidential election is a totally different type of coordination that needs to go on than what goes on, for example, what we're seeing in the midterm election season happening right now in primaries where politics really is much more local and about congressional districts and so forth. And, and we're seeing different kinds of variation across the primaries right now. Um, but I think that the, our politics has become so much more nationalized. Uh, our parties, I think, are essentially severely hampered uh, to separate these. Um, I think if they could operate as a national organization that focused on presidential elections and then local organizations that focused on congressional and state and local elections, um, and they had the infrastructure and, and the financing set up and so forth to actually operate that way, um, it would be better. <laughs> um, and I think they, it's essentially very difficult for them to do that now, in part because our politics itself is so nationalized and partisanship and parties are seen as such a national thing and I, you know, we can think about how media plays into that and national agenda and discussion and so forth and just how much space there is in any local, uh, you know, any local congressional district, this, the air in the room is being sucked up by national politics. Um, and so it's, it's more difficult for the parties to play at that diverse level. So is there, are, are there any ways that they can, they can change the way they go about doing their business that might address that? I think there, I think there possibly are, and I'm, I'm, Seth is closer to what what the parties are doing um, at the more local level and in, in the infrastructure of the organizations um, than I am. But I, I have a sense that if parties were uh, empowering their localities in ways that allowed them to engage in candidate recruitment and candidate training and constructing the local issues, whatever they are, in ways that advantage the part partisan candidates in, in, in local districts, whether that's state legislature or, or congressional districts or whatever, um, that that would be advantageous to the parties at the national level, but they need to have the tools and the resources to be able to localize. And the parties have to be willing to have a local candidate that flies off the rails and, and maybe doesn't follow the national agenda on a particular issue. Um, but in general, 
politics is not about issues these days. Uh, the partisanship and the parties and the camps in which we see ourselves as partisans um, is really driving people's uh, taste for politics. Um, so it, it, to me, that should empower parties to like let the issues go. The issues don't matter. It almost doesn't matter what issues the local candidates are going to talk about um, because the, the partisanship is going to rule the day anyway. Do you, do you all have a view on, on uh, when, you, when you read about what's going on within the Democratic Party in the primaries, uh, Seth made an observation about the Republicans this year, you know, we're going back to Roy Moore, um, it, it's, uh, and it's sort of the Sanders and other progressive organizations doing battle, you know, with uh, uh, Democrats who want to see candidates who might be slightly more moderate. Um, uh, are the de where where is the Democratic Party on this? Are they headed up headed for some sort of crack up, uh, or is this is this just really just about style? We need and another cycle. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. <laughs> but it, time, time to make a prediction. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think they are going through a fight between their activists and their elected officials, especially in Washington. That is interesting to watch. Uh, uh, Democrats in Washington, I think, have a sense that they should not go too far. Um, and that they cannot make Trump the focus of everything they do. But the activist energy wants to do just that. And uh, that's a problem that's very similar to the one Republicans faced in dealing with Barack Obama during the last presidential administration. Um, I think Democrats have the added pressure here. If they win the House, they're going to need to impeach the president. It, it'll be very hard for them to avoid at least starting that process because that's where their activists are. And I would say the, the leaders of the Democratic Party in Washington do not want to do that because they don't think it would be good for the party uh, going forward. But good luck to them trying to stop it. I, I, I think they will be under immense pressure to do it. So it's not a crack up in the sense that the party falls apart, but I think that it's intense pressure that is the kind of thing that a party might exist to help address. And so it'll be a test. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jennifer, you brought up campaign finance. You know, what do we need to look at and think about if there's going to, if there were to be reforms in that area, or either changes in the way the parties go about their business? Yeah, so it's it's a sticky issue. It's very complicated. <laughs> um, but the so the the Supreme Court rule. So we changed the campaign finance law in 2002 under what was known as the McCain-Feingold bill, um, and then it got updated again in 2010 with the a, a couple, Supreme Court decision and some following FEC decisions. Um, known as Citizens United and then Speech Now. And the result of those reforms over that period are a great decentralization of our campaign finance system, where the parties used to have quite a bit of power in controlling things, and there was this soft money. Everybody was worried about the soft money through all the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and this was the big thing that John McCain and, and his various political partners uh, were all worried about. The parties were being used as a basically a money laundering machine that were allowing donors to funnel as much unlimited money as they want to candidates. But it turns out, in retrospect, <laughs> uh, that money laundering was somewhat healthy for the system <laughs> because it was giving the parties control over where the money went. So what we have now is the soft money in that sense is gone. The parties aren't doing that funneling anymore because of the way the laws have changed. Uh, but that money is still out there and it's just happening on its own. So whatever wealthy donors or organizations or activists or whoever want to get involved, they're out there picking their candidates or picking their horse uh, in local races or national races and just going after them. Now, to stay within the confines of the law, they technically are not allowed to coordinate with the parties. Otherwise, then it's seen as a, a campaign donation and it's limited by law. But So they're in this atmosphere where they can raise as much money as they want um, in this unlimited way without the party filter that tends to kind of moderate things. Um, so it would be helpful, I think, to change the laws in a way that strengthened parties. Uh, that gave parties more control over where the money came from and where it went. Um, it's not clear to me what the viable either legislative or judicial path to make that happen is at this point. Yeah. What do you think, Seth? Just on the, yeah, the, the question, fixing the party kind of fixing thing? Fixing parties broadly, but on the campaign finance side. Uh, you know, because you go, you know, Jennifer refers to back in the 90s, you know, Clinton allegedly uh, rented out the Lincoln, Lincoln bedroom. So that, that made it look bad, even if it was good for the party, right, to do that kind of thing. And then uh, you know he, he you know he found the I guess his people found the big loophole at that time. Um, is there something that we don't know about now? Well, of course, then we we don't know about it. We can't talk about it, right? <laughs> but it, you know we have to think a little bit outside the box. If there's going to be reform, 
you know, things that worked in the past probably aren't going to work now for all kinds of reasons. You know, where are you on that? Yeah, I mean, the problem, and this is, this is the, the basis of my last book, that, you know, every time we reform them, there's, there's all these unanticipated consequences right. that uh, we don't always think about. And, you know, just when you attempt to sort of wall off a certain type of spending, the money's going to get there somehow. Um, if someone wants to spend on a race, someone wants to donate to a candidate, somehow that money is going to get into the system. It's just a matter of, um, you know, every time we, we cut off a certain barrier for it, we make that money less, less traceable. And uh, we make the system of just, you know, tracking who donated to whom a lot harder to follow, um, which is generally undesirable things. Um, yeah, I would love to see, you know, as, as, you know, similar with Jen, I would love to see more of, more funding going through the formal party system. I would love to see the parties themselves have more power to allocate. Uh, that money rather than sending it across, you know, a hundred different groups. Um, you know, more generally, just kind of outside of the, uh, of the campaign finance system, I would, and this is, I know, an uphill battle, but I would love to see the parties being less democratic. That is, you know, I would... I small would, D. Yeah, yeah, small D democratic. That is, um, you know, more elite driven, um, less, uh, you know, less subject to what uh, individual members within the party want. Um, the, the Democratic National Committee right now, um, this summer, is probably, they're working on some sort of reforms. They're probably either going to get rid of their superdelegate system or they're going to substantially sort of disempower the superdelegates. Superdelegates are, of course, the, uh, uh, the people within the party. They're DNC members. They're elected officials who have a vote at the nominating convention, um, regardless of what uh, primary voters want. And uh, just as some of the reforms coming out of 2016, they're, they're going to substantially disempower those people most likely. And which is in some ways remarkable given what they saw going on on the Republican side in 2016, where in, in, in many ways elites did not have enough control over what was going on, and yet they're, they're moving in that same direction that the Republicans moved. Now, I haven't been hugely impressed with the power superdelegates have or, or their, the power that they're willing to exercise to push back against their own party's voters. Um, but if anything, they, the party seemed to be moving in more of a small d democratic direction, um, which I, I think in some ways carries a lot of danger. And, and I know you've a lot of, lot of uh, uh, when you read a, a lot of uh, Republican or conservative intellectuals that said, well, let's, let's have the Republican party, you know, let's define it the way we want to define it, free trade, low taxes, et cetera, um, cutting back on entitlements. and. Uh, 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 and, and Trump doesn't fit that. You know, there's a lot of talk in, in conservative intellectual uh, circles. And so let's be clear what our party is about and if there's short-term consequences. But nobody really had the power to do that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is that effort still going on? Is there any prospect of success for that kind of effort? Well, I, I think that it's not been much of an actual concrete effort. Um, I, I, I do agree that there are ways to uh, re-empower the parties some in our system relative to the other uh, forces at work. And I think that allowing the parties to raise much more money but in a more transparent way, w we sort of have to ask ourselves, w what is the least illegitimate place for all that money to go? And I think the parties are the answer to that question. So that, because <laughs> their goal is to create broad coalitions. And that's what we ought to want our politics to involve. Um, and so I think we ought to allow the parties to be the place where a lot of money goes, provided that it is transparent. Um, and it also seems to me that the parties gaining some control over their own processes are a way to address some of these problems, as, as Seth suggests, that the parties have to realize that they are owners of very, very powerful brands. They, they have a banner. And whoever gets that banner in a presidential election <laughs> is going to get at least 45% of the vote in that election. Literally, whoever they are. I mean, if we have learned anything, <laughs> it is that. And so they have got to realize that that is a, an immense responsibility and to take very seriously the responsibility they have to own that banner that comes with 45% of the vote in a presidential election. Uh, you know, that person is basically going to have pretty much an even shot of becoming president. So they need to think about how they choose who that person is because they have an obligation to the country. And at this point, they just fall down on the job in doing that. They allow it to happen of its own. I think Republicans have a tendency to follow the Democrats in setting rules. They're kind of lackadaisical about setting rules for, uh, for nominating processes. The, the rules of the presidential nominating process now were adopted by the Democrats after, I think, a pretty thoughtful process in the 1970s where they really fought out their differences. And 
the process that emerged from that was suited to the dynamics of the Democratic coalition at the time. Mm -hmm. And then the Republican Party just adopted it wholesale without really thinking about how it related to its own coalition. Um, something like that is happening again. I think the Democrats are talking about how to change the process. I don't know if they'll be able to do it, but they're at least thinking about it. There's, there's really nothing at all like that going on that I can see on the Republican side. I just wanted to add that thinking about, I think it's worthwhile to take a, a slightly longer view in thinking about how we got to this point where our parties are relatively decentralized, um, because I think there's a, a trade-off, right? So if you go back to the early part of the 19th uh, or 20th century, what you had were really centralized parties. You, in fact, had party bosses in the proverbial smoke-filled room and these you know, couple of people who basically made all the choices about who were gonna be the candidates and where the money was gonna go and so forth. Um, and that system was incredibly corrupt. <laughs> and it, it was easily captured and it was, it was very un-small D democratic. Uh, and so the, the push in the 100 years since then, I think, has been more, towards more democratization of the parties uh, to give the voters greater influence um, in, in all of those things, the candidate selection and the recruitment and everything that, that parties do. Um, and what we're seeing now is we're at the other end of that spectrum. And what we're seeing is there's huge costs to this end as well. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, there's essentially a trade-off, I think, between centralized parties uh, and decentralized parties, where at one end you get, uh, you get less polarization and, and really effective, clean results, but with corruption. And at the other end, you get dysfunction and disorganization, but we don't have that kind of corruption that we used to be worried about. Like, I mean, yeah, you get a Jack Abramoff story or something like that every once in a while, but those are really pretty rare these days. Like, we've really gotten rid of that type of corruption in our politics. And the price that we're paying for it is this dysfunction, this terrible polarization. We focus on the glass half full there. For <laughs> something like that. So I feel like there's an equilibrium to be had in the middle, and, but, the, but the parties, I'm, it's not clear to me at all that the, the parties as organizations, if I could speak of them as having a central brain, um, are aware of, of the necess necessity of finding that equilibrium. Before we get to some questions from the audience, I wanted to, to you know, I, I play off on one thing that Yuval said, uh, and I think he's right, that each party kind of starts with 45% in a presidential election. Sometimes they don't get much more than that. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and so, Democrat banner, Republican banner. Uh, Seth, what's the chances there could be a different banner sometime? <laughs> not, what what not would that large. look like? No. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you know, France yeah. suddenly, you know, yeah. overnight suddenly they have a guy getting all the votes and getting all the legislative seats. Different system. Mm -hmm. And now Italy is doing the same thing. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, what happens, sometimes what happens in Europe affects us here. It doesn't always go the other, other direction, even if we'd like to think that. And so there, there's something out there that there's a dissatisfaction, obviously, that, that I, don't, I don't know whether it's reached that level or whether our system is, is, is more, uh, you know, ossified or something. You know, I mean, uh, this is one of those areas where I think we probably focus too much on the presidential level, um, where the two-party uh, two party outcomes just are, are very resilient. I mean, you could possibly see a scenario where, you know, Trump suddenly becomes very unpopular, there's a recession or something like that, and Republicans want to run someone else in 2020, and he splits off and forms his own party. I mean, you could sort of see something like that, but probably not lasting in the long run. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a fascinating sort of counterexample to this in, um, in Colorado in 2010. Uh, there, was a, there was a gubernatorial election. Uh, that's where the Democrats first elected John Hickenlooper. Um, the Republicans, uh, through a bizarre series of, of um, there was a, a big Tea Party rally and there was a scandal for the sort of the favorite candidate and a, um, this little known uh, Tea Party activist named Dan Mays ended up getting the Republican nomination through the primary there. And the Republican Party didn't like him. Like all the Republican leaders just said, this guy is totally irresponsible. He was going all over the place with uh, these very paranoid uh, theories about how the UN was gonna take over through a bike sharing program and <laughs> that sort of thing. And he was quite sincere. Um, That's benign. And so a lot of state Republican leaders backed uh, Tom Tancredo as a third party candidate to run for governor. Um, knowing it was probably going to split the vote, but basically saying, we don't want to win with this. We, don't, we, don't, we think this is actually bad for the party in the long run if we all rally behind our, our nominee. And it did split the Republican vote and Hickenlooper won in a, in a, pretty, easy, in a pretty easy run. Um, but that sort of thing happens a little more at the, at the state and local level um, than, you, than you definitely see at the presidential level. But again, 
the two-party system is so deeply ingrained and so favored by um, systems we have here. If we, if we did have a third party, it, it would likely become the second party very quickly as the other party just disappeared. Any thoughts on that? You well, I agree. I think we've seen that a little bit. I mean, the, the, the durability of a two-party system, I even when the, the Federalists or the Whigs went away, pretty quickly we were back to a two-party system. The 1912 presidential race where the Republicans really split and there were really two Republican candidates and three presidential candidates. That seemed like the end of the Republican Party. And one cycle later, the party was back basically to itself. Um, and so, you know, a part of it is structural and the first past the post election system and the rest of it. I think our system really is just geared to a two party system. That doesn't mean it could never change, but I, I think the parties have survived times that have been uh, more dramatically problematic than what they're going through now. It could get crazier, it could get worse, but I don't see it at this point. Thank you all for your insights. We'll move to some questions. Um, let's uh, bring it up to the gentleman in the front. Um, wait, wait, we got, a, we got a microphone for you here. Oh, here's a microphone. <laughs> um, how does like, polarization in the, in the general population play a part in this? Like, I've noticed, at least in my lifetime, it's, it's really increased how people are very either extremely Democratic or extremely Republican. Um, I, I mean, it happens in my school, and it happens in people older than me. You know, one of the striking things about polarization is that the most aggressively partisan people hate their parties on both sides. <laughs> uh, and so the, the, there is a way in which strengthening polarization actually undermines the strength of the parties as institutions, as organizations, and empowers these smaller groups that represent kind of subcultures within the party. Um, and so I think it's not a coincidence that we've seen increasing polarization at the same time as weakening institutional parties. Um, part of what the parties do is broaden their own coalitions and you know, allow a Republican who is running in Massachusetts to be a little less conservative than a Republican who is running uh, in Texas. And that becomes more difficult to do as polarization grows and, and the parties weaken at the same time. Who else had somebody over here? Um, Greg, that guy in the, in the middle. Uh, hi, thank you all for coming out to the uh, Library of Congress today. I just had a question regarding the future of parties in regards to uh, voter systems. And uh, I'm based in New England recently, and there's been a lot of talk about uh, Maine and perhaps Vermont adopting the uh, instant runoff ranked choice system of voting, which would um, most likely, theoretically, collapse the idea of Big Ten coalitions, but at the same time, give people more uh, fluidity when it comes to elections. If something like this was implemented or advocated for at the national level, could you see it succeeding? And if so, what do you think the outcome would be? Beth might just speak to that on the end. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the thing is, actually trying to implement something like uh, instant runoff voting at the national level, uh, there, there's a lot of questions in there. Is that Are we talking about making that part of the electoral college calculation within every state? Are we talking about an actual national popular vote? Um, there's a lot of changes that would have to occur to get to that point. Um, it's potentially an interesting case, though. And um, it, it's, it's possible to see if you had some sort of like a national primary system uh, with, with instant runoff voting. Um, you might have had, you know, the Republicans might have come up with something very different than Donald Trump last time around. I mean, if you have, if there's no one who everyone you know, seems to like for their first round choice, but everyone is sort of okay with John Kasich or something like that, um, you could end up with that sort of a, 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 sort of a consensus nominee. Um, there was, I mean, even going back to, um, there was some great quote from uh, when Lincoln was running in 1860, uh, that his whole strategy, I think it was actually a quote from him saying, my whole strategy is to be everyone's second favorite candidate. Um, you know, just so you get sort of all the all the sort of most most passionate people on every side of the party just kind of cancel each other out, and they all say, "Yeah, but I'd be okay with him," and that's kind of how you get in. And I think something like instant runoff voting actually helps that occur. We had somebody over here, right there, Mike. Hi, thanks for coming out. Um, so my question's a bit reflective. Um, when I was younger, I looked. I am older than, a lot older than when I look. So when I was younger, I did 10 years in the Marine Corps, and so I was had this mindset of you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Now that I'm 40 plus and have two kids, 117 and 115, I've been a teacher. 
I, and I've seen that that is not the case for African Americans. So as I taught fourth grade, teaching them the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and especially that 14th Amendment about um, equal quali equality for African Americans. And we were discussing the Brown versus the Board of Education. And I've lived in many states before, but then I started reading and learning about how Virginia was able to circumvent that Brown Board of, Board of Education and how that still plays a part today in our education system and how negatively it impacts African Americans. And I was talking to my husband yesterday and I was like, where could an African American mom, our family go to an African American community that is thriving, that you have doctors, lawyers, hospitals that look like you. There's very few places that you can go. And I, for, and I'm, I asked him that question because I spent a year as a teacher in a very wealthy community where teachers did not want to work with me simply because of my color. That never happened to me in the Marine Corps. And, ten years that, and I could say, well, thank God for all the African Americans that had came before me. But why would I want to put my kids through that ordeal? Why would they have to have to endure that simply because? And then I don't, I, I, Republican or Democratic, there's not enough of African Americans to make it a valid that we have a valid say. So regardless of what party is voting, when do we get past the nationalism of, of, uh, of isms? When do we get past that and look at people for their humanity? Because if we're spending so much money on, on making sure other countries do it right, but we don't do it right, and I can't send my kids, my daughter graduates next year, I don't feel comfortable sending her into a work environment that she has to do, to, to endure what I endured and is still enduring simply because we raise communities to believe that we're one better than the other because of isms. How do we so, address um, that? So the, uh, you know, I think one of, the, one of the ways we could maybe uh, talk about that is to, is to talk about how is it that, that, that minorities, whether ethnic or racial or other you know, sexual orientation, other minorities, how do they get influence within the party system? You know, what's a good way to think about that? So to me, part of, part of what's going on in polarization in American politics right now, um, and you're speaking primarily about the African American community, which has largely for the last 50 years or so been kind of solidly married to the Democratic Party. Um, for uh, largely, I was gonna say for better or worse, but really it's for worse that throughout American history, one part of the year, one party or the other has essentially always kind of been, I don't want to put this impolitely, but sort of married to the racist devil, right? So for lots of the 19th century and into the 20th century, it was the Democratic Party. They were the party of slavery. They were the party that controlled the South and fought to maintain slavery and then ultimately lost, but then found various institutions to kind of keep that culture going. Um, until you get to the middle part of the 20th century and the Democratic Party reforms on that issue. Uh, and you get actors like John F. Kennedy and LBJ and others who pick up the mantle of civil rights, look at the African American community as sort of opportunistically bringing this new portion of the electorate uh, into the party. They did that quite well. The Republican Party responds and pivots by following what Nixon called the Southern strategy. Um, and that sets off the, the Democratic and American and, and Republican parties on their, what is now their current path um, in which the Democratic Party much more strongly holds the mantle of civil rights um, and the Republican Party is uh, often the counter to that. Um, and so part of what I think perpetuates this and prevents us from getting beyond it in some of the ways that, that you're expressing is that as a country we've never really reconciled how to get beyond uh, our legacy of slavery. Uh, we've never done a very good job as a country of, of showing complicity there and showing uh, some sense of contrition for the role that we played in perpetuating that economy um, for hundreds of years. Um, and it's 
now completely baked into our political parties in ways that is divisive rather than in ways that promote some kind of healing. And lots of institutions perpetuate this. And I'm not just talking about structural racism, but I mean, federalism itself, the fact that we have states and the United States Senate, like all of these institutions were in some ways uh, created to perpetuate slavery. Um, and, and our inability to overcome that issue and to really fully reconcile with it as a country and as a people, I think has it much more baked into our politics in ways uh, that are really difficult to reconcile at this point until we get political actors who decide they want to, to try to address that. So I often think about um, uh, in the post-Nazi period in Germany, you can't go into a town village or hamlet in the, all of Germany without finding some memorial somewhere to the Holocaust. Um, it's, it's a part of the national identity, it's a part of the national culture to so show, show some some national contrition for their participation in that genocide. And America has never done that with slavery. Um, and I think, I think that affects the way our partisan politics deals with that issue even today. So we have uh, time for one or two more questions. We'll get take these two here, uh, David and then uh, the woman in front. Hi, I have a, a question about um, party coalitions and, and evolving party coalitions. So um, as all of you know, uh, there's an education realignment uh, that's occurred where the Democrats now have something close to a 25 percentage point advantage among whites with college degrees. That wasn't true even 15 years ago. They have a 35 percentage point advantage with uh, whites with advanced degrees. And I wonder how long uh, a party coalition um, on both sides can continue in terms of the policies that they advocate um, not match its constituency because at the same time, while we have this difference in terms of education, we also see a, a closer uh, correlation between education and income than we did even a generation ago. And so at some point, you would expect actually the Democrats to, to flip and start advocating for lower taxes and, and less regulation. Um, it's not happening right now, but I wonder if you guys want to speculate about what will happen in a generation. <laughs> Tough question. You, either of you guys want to say something? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> I won't speculate about what will happen in a generation. Uh, having gone through 2016, I don't even speculate about what's going to happen next Wednesday. <laughs> but I do think that um, we shouldn't overestimate the degree to which economic interest drives voters' self-understanding about political interests. One of the things we've, we've been learning in this century about our politics is that people care about what we think of as kind of cultural and identity issues much more than they care about economic issues. And in some ways, both of the parties now are advocating things that are against the economic interests of their core constituents. Um, and you know, Republicans are the party of the elderly that wants to change Social Security, or they used to want to. Uh, they, uh, they're, they're the party of the working class that wants to lower their boss's taxes. If you think about <laughs> economics that way, I mean, politics that way as, a, as, a, as an extension of economics, it just doesn't make sense. But the party coalitions make more sense if you think about what it is that people in these economic brackets value most and what they care about, what they believe in. I think in that way, the coalitions make some more sense. And so it may be that what, what you're really seeing is that uh, higher income people in America have certain cultural attitudes and, uh, and views that incline them more toward uh, the, the, the left-wing party in our politics. And the working class people in America tend to have uh, more conservative views on the issues that they care about most. So, you know, it used to be said that, that conservatives care most about the culture and liberals care more about, most about the economy, but the right keeps winning on the economy and the left keeps winning on the culture. So we're kind of permanently frustrated. I, I think we're actually at a point now where both coalitions seem to care most about cultural issues, yeah. one way or another. Okay, last question. We have one of our friends from the University of Denver. Thank you. Um, more women than ever are running for office this year, and I wanted to know what do we think the increased women, number of women eventually holding office, if that will change anything within the political party system? That's a great question. I let both Jennifer and Seth speak to that in whichever order you'd like. So um, the literature suggests that once women win office, they tend to legislate much the same way men do. Um, that being said, uh, so, so to, on one hand, you might not think actually politics would be very much different in terms of policy. Um, on the other hand, there's a, a good amount of literature that suggests that 
women tend to um, sort of behave differently in office as leaders, as managers, um, as, as running either their personal offices or their committees or whatever position it is they have. And I'm thinking of members of Congress. Um, uh, and so it could be that there are more subtle forms of negotiation or management or politicking um, that changes uh, operations at a, uh, a level that's more difficult for scholars like us to observe, um, uh, except perhaps in the long run. Uh, so I guess I'm of mixed mind about this. On the one hand, I think m creating a Congress that looks more like America is a good thing. We know that there are huge advantages to having some uh, level of descriptive representation, um, uh, whether that's race or gender or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that once uh, a minority group, whether that you're talking about race or women or whatever, uh, come into office uh, and they reach a certain level, they tend to sort of then wind up acting just like the people who were there before. Um, so there are dividends to be paid on the front side, I think, for recruiting a more diverse crop of candidates to run for office. Um, and it might be that there will be dividends to pay in politicking and management of politics uh, in the long run. How exactly we observe that in policy is a little bit more uh, abstract, I think. You got anything else? Hey, Julie. Um, so uh, check me if I'm wrong here, but I think um, uh, women tend to be, within both parties, women tend to be more liberal than men, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, both within the Republican and within the Democratic parties. And uh, so, you know, that, you know, as their numbers increase among elected officials, that tends to suggest it will somewhat change. Sure. Um, it, 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 could, it could end up making the Republican Party more moderate, it could end up making the Democratic Party more liberal. Um, and interestingly, it's not just on things, it's not even on things like reproductive rights, um, where actually women's views and men's views are very similar, it turns out. Um, but on just sort of general economic issues, on general um, social welfare issues. Um, that could have the effect of, of moving the system somewhat to the left. Now, it depends where these women are getting elected. My, my guess is, and my understanding is, most of them are, are running as, uh, as Democrats. Um, most, of the, most of the women who are running for Congress right now are running as Democrats, and so that, that probably have a, a greater effect on the Democratic Party than on the Republican right now. But um, yeah, we could see a, a different effect across both parties. Well, thank you all three for your insights on the future of political parties, and thank you for attending. We have a reception here. And, uh, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.